Should there be an autonomous Kurdistan? And if yes, how should it look like territory-wise? Are the Kurds a reliable ally against more hardline versions of the religion of peace? Not an easy set of questions for sure. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of Freedom Alternative Research and Analysis. Alright, so, uh, one of our patrons asked me to look closer into the Kurdish question, specifically on the current situations and ideas for the future. However, I can't really do that until we understand at least a little bit about the past, which is why I kinda stayed away from this topic and it took a paid Patreon subscription to specifically ask me to do it. <laughs> but on a more serious note, this is a monstrous topic on which no matter what I say, I'll still leave out a lot of things. There are tens of thousands of books and millions of articles that have been written on this issue, and many of them in languages that I do not speak, such as Persian, Arabic, Turkish and German. Anyway, so, for the purposes of this video, we'll uh, be looking at the following aspects. 1. Short history of the Kurdish people and language. 2. The emergence of the so-called Kurdish question. 3. The PKK period. 4. Current political and cultural context of the Kurdish people. And here we'll touch a little bit on religion as well. Uh, 5. P uh, specific questions, i.e. Uh, the questions asked to me by the patron uh, whom we already are appreciative of his pledge, of course. And six, miscellaneous. <laughs> All right, so buckle up, because this ain't going to be short. So, when we say Kurds or Kurdish people, the European slash Western conscience immediately thinks at one of the two things either thinks of the PKK and maybe Abdullah Hocalan, the former PKK, currently serving a life sentence in Turkey and for forming a armed terrorist movements, or more recently, other imagery has also become associated with the Kurds, namely the divisions of Kurdish women fighting against the Islamic State. Now, both of these imageries have some connection to reality. Yes, the PKK exists, and it's quite as bad as the media used to tell you it is. That is, before the media decided that terrorists are very nice people, which happened in the last several years. And yes, there are divisions of Kurdish females fighting against the Islamic State, although it's not your average Kurdish woman. But specifically, the Kurdish women who subscribe to a particular type of ideology and join the YPJ, which is a branch of uh, Yakine Empire Stina Gil, the YBG, which in turn is the military wing of the Democratic Union Party, which is the largest political party of Western Kurdistan and incidentally a communist hard left party, less demented than the PKK, but still relatively within the same area. So, how did all of this happen? Well, long story short, the Kurds, although numerous, were quite late to the party known as the National Awakening period in the late 19th century and specific, especially after World War I, so they kinda got left out uh, from this question. Nevertheless, the Kurdish people are one of the very old peoples of this world. The land of Karda, believed to be roughly the modern ideal Kurdistan, is mentioned in Sumerian tablets as far back as the mid-2000s BC, so over 4,000 years ago. Although the so-called Kurdish questions, about which we'll be talking in the next segment, didn't emerge until the 20th century, in a way there has been a Kurdish question at the very least since the 7th century. What happened in the 7th century? Well, Islam happened. Muhammad conquered the area and since then there have been trouble. 
Now, admittedly, besides Islam, there was also the fact that by the 7th century, the Kurdish ethnic identity also became much more clear and was drawn to be a descendant of the former Medes, an ancient Iranian people. So, you can guess why they weren't so keen on Islam, if you know a thing or two about the Iranian peoples. And yes, I say peoples because Persians are just one Iranian people. Modern Armenians are another Armenian, uh, another Iranian people, just like Swedes and Germans are Germanic peoples. Anyway, the point is that since Islam came to the area, there are numerous documented conflicts between a mysterious group uh, in the north and the Caliph. Muhammad al-Tabari, uh, a noted Persian scholar of the 9th century, writes that in 639, Anno Domini, uh, Hormuzan, a Sasanian general originating from a, a noble family, battled against the Islamic invaders in Khuzestan and called upon the Kurds to aid him in the battle. The battle was lost, but the Kurds never gave up. In 1838, Mir Jafar, a Kurdish leader from Mosul, Yes, that Mosul revolts against the Caliph uh, al Mutasim, attempting to overthrow the Islamic rule. Mir Jafar loses the battle against the Islamic commander Itah, who then proceeds, after winning the battle, to do things the Islamic way, which is to execute most of the Kurds in the area. It took another 100 years and many other uprisings until a significant proportion of the Kurds were converted to Islam and incorporated into the apparatus of Dar al-Islam. Nevertheless, even after a conversion, the Kurds still tried to retain autonomy and do things their way rather than the Caliph's way. Now, in this new framework, several Kurdish dynasties emerged as local rulers, the most important being the Dailamit Buid dynasty, which by the end of the 11th century ends up ruling most of the modern-day Iran and Iraq under the Kurdish leader Badr in, uh, in Hassan Wai. Uh, who not only keeps the much-wanted autonomy for the Kurds, but he also establishes himself as one of the very highly respected emirs within the Islamic world, thus ensuring that non-Kurdish Muslims would not trample on his fiefdom. However, what looks nice tends to not last that much when Islam is involved. So just when things were finally somewhat stable, the Ottomans emerge and take down everything in the 11th century, and now the Kurds were yet again on the road trying to find an administration that wouldn't slaughter them. For a while, they joined the Zangid dynasty under the Seljuk uh, Empire, or Seljuk Empire, depending, and established the Kurdish dynasty of Ayyubids. But then the Mongols invasion, the Mongol invasions came around in 1341 and the Ayyubid Sultanate fell alongside everything else under the Mongol rule. When that finally ended, it followed a small period of prosperity under a very popular Persian leader and then the Ottomans come, came around again and annexed everything and by everything I mean all of the territories where Kurds could be found. Now, that wasn't really that bad after all. In fact, for almost four centuries, being under the Ottoman umbrella wasn't particularly burdensome. It certainly was better than most periods before 1514, when the Ottoman rule began over the area. Under Ottoman rule, the Kurds were more or less left alone, as decided by the uh, conquering Sultan Selim I, who appointed a Kurdish historian to manage things and recommended that at autonomy of uh, two localities be paramount. Now, this was usually the Ottoman way, by the way. Now... Idris, the, the Kurdish historian, did exactly that. He respected as much um, of the local customs as possible, and he also made Erivan, that would be modern-day Yerevan, which we'll visit this summer. Just a hint. Anyway, he made Erivan great again. Namely, he resettled people in the area, as the area had been laying in waste for almost a century. 
This situation lasted until mid-19th century, when the Ottoman Empire started becoming centralist and started taking power away from localities and directed it towards the Sultan, personally. Now this pissed off the Kurds quite a lot since they were the ones most affected by it, so in 1847 starts the first out of many, many Kurdish nationalist uprisings in modern times, with Bediran Bey leading the, that particular uh, uprising. Now, some scholars thinks the, think this wasn't a nationalist uprising per se, although it is much more widely acknowledged that his children are the most influential figures in shaping Kurdish nationalism to this day. So, yeah, there's that. Anyway. The point of this segment is this, the Kurdish quest for autonomy is not something new. It didn't start with the PKK or with the imperialist Western intervention as many leftists, including Kurdish leftists, would have you believe. This is a very, very old story. Many of the so-called Western imperial powers weren't even in existence when the Kurds were fighting against everyone for autonomy. Now keep that in mind as we progress uh, throughout this video. So, uh, with that said, Kurds having, uh, haven't been quite a unified group, well, well never basically. As a result, the Kurdish language is in itself a misnomer. The Kurdish language is actually a collection of languages. Now to learn more about the Kurdish language and how it sounds, if you're very curious, I'll recommend a dedicated video on this by the channel Lang Focus, a channel geeks like me absolutely do watch. <laughs> what? Well, what I'll say here is that the Kurdish language is the collection of Indo-Iranian languages consisting of the Kurmanji dialect group, the Sorani dialect group, and other sub-dialects uh, such as uh, Kermanshahi, Ardalani, Laki, and so on and so forth. Also, not all Kurdish people speak a Kurdish language. There are at least four people groups, uh, the Zaza, the Dimli, the Gorani, and the Shabaki, who consider themselves to be ethnically Kurdish, and yet their languages, the Zaza Gorani uh, group, um, are also languages that are part of the nor Northwestern Iranian group, but are not part of the Kurdish language group. All right. So with that said, let's move to segment two, the emergence of the Kurdish question in modern times. Now, this is a touchy subject about which we could spend two hours without repeating ourselves, but the broad idea is that as the Ottoman Empire was collapsing following the conclusion of World War I, the areas held by the Empire in the Middle East and the Caucasus were divided largely by the victors, that would be Britain and France, and largely without enough consideration of the ethnic composition of those lands. Now, there were many questions between 1918 and 1923. There was the Armenian question, answered through the creation of modern-day Armenia, the Turkish question, settled through the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne, and was the Kurdish question, which was, well, never settled. The 1920 Treaty of Sèvres did in fact specify that a small Kurdish state is to be built, provided that this corresponded with the coll collective will of the Kurdish people, and that an Armenian state would also be built uh, from some provinces of eastern Anatolia. These conditions, however, were rejected by tribal leaders and sheikhs because the territory of the proposed Kurdish state was too small relative to the region actually occupied by the Kurdish population. Now, on top of this, the sheikhs believed that the territory would have been further reduced by the emergence of an Armenian state, and this is by far one of the worst decisions made by uh, the Kurdish leaders, for sure. Anyway. At the same time as these discussions were taking place, other Kurdish factions tried to join the Kemalists, which was the nationalist movement of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, which eventually, eventually led to the creation of modern-day secular Turkey. Now, this also didn't work out that well, particularly when the Kemalists found out uh, that the factions who were attempting to join 
uh, to join their little movement were Marxist. So in 1921, their faction is massacred following the Kotsiri uprising. And the Ottoman Pasha, who conducted the, the whole thing, was uh, shielded from trial by Kemal Atatürk. That's lovely, isn't it? Now, since then, the Kurdish nationalism has been creating troubles all over the place. Again, to avoid turning this video into a very, very long lecture, I'll just mention briefly some of them. In Iraq, uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Barzandi, uh, or Barzanji, uh, the self-proclaimed king of Kurdistan, was uh, amongst the first to take the head of the nationalist movement, followed by the Barzani family. Uh, in Turkey, there were 18 uprisings in less than 15 years, between 1927 and 1938, with the nationalist movements based in Ararat and in Dersim. The most hardline of them were the Syrian Kurds, uh, who took part uh, in most of these revolts. In Iran, in 1946, on January the 22nd, an autonomous republic is proclaimed riding on the coattails of the Soviet occupation. That one failed too, because it did not mobilize uh, the whole of the Iranian Kurds, though many Kurds in Turkey and Iran did rush to defend that particular move. Now, this so-called Republic of Mahabad was dissolved in December the same year, 1946, by the Iranian army, which had its president executed. Now, many of the top supporters of that project sought and indeed find refuge in the United so in the USSR, in the Soviet Union. Um, this entire period, uh, way, uh, way until the 1990s, is inextricably connected to far-left Algitprop and Soviet subversion. Now, leftist revisionists of today, including Kurdish leftists, like to complain that the Kurdish uprisings were unfairly accused everywhere of conspiring with foreign po uh, powers, often across borders, and were crushed in concert by the countries concerned, namely Iran, Turkey, or Iraq. Well, it is true that they were crushed, but the accusations weren't unfair at all. The Soviet Union used the Kurds to destabilize other countries in the area constantly and consistently right up until those countries would enter into the USSR's sphere of influence, like it happened with Iran in 1979. Then, suddenly, the USSR's concern about the human rights of Kurds went uh, and their right to self-determination just vanished into thin air. The same thing happened in Turkey. The Soviet Union didn't give a damn about the Kurds uh, in Turkey until 1952 when Turkey joined NATO, when suddenly there was funding available for any nationalist Kurdish movement. The more commie, the better. Unsurprisingly, Russia thinks the PKK is a swell movement even today, and has always thought so. All right, so this is a good uh, segue to the next segment. Segment three, the PKK period. Now, the PKK period isn't really that long, but because it occurred in the postmodern era, it has sort of gotten to define Kurdish nationalism in the public eye, which is not exactly great for the cause of Kurdish nationalism because PKK is a highly degenerate thing in and of itself. So. The PKK stands for Partia Karker and Kurdistane, or the Kurdistan Workers' Party, and it was originally a Marxist-Leninist militant group fighting to establish a Kurdish Marxist-Leninist state in the so-called Turkish Kurdistan. The PKK is founded in 1978 by the man who officially still runs the group, Abdullah Ocalan. I say officially because the PKK works pretty much like the North Korea. The eternal president doctrine is in full swing. In practice, the group is led by uh, Jemil Baik, um, an individual that is even more radical than Abdullah Ocalan, and who has been the head of PKK's military wing since the formation of the military wing in 1984. Now, Jemil Baik seized the opportunity after the arrest of Abdullah Ocalan to kick the reformists within the organization, thus ensuring that the PKK remains the insane organization that has always been. 
In the power struggle that started after the conviction of Abdullah Jalan, Jamil Baik teamed up with another hardliner, uh, Mural, uh, sorry, Murat Karailan, against the reformist wing led by Osman Ocalan, that would be Abdullah's younger brother, and uh, Nizamettin Tash and Kani Ilmaz. Now, Nizamettin Tash, for instance, rejected violence as a means uh, to achieve things and now leads the non-violent Patriotic Democratic Party in Iraqi Kurdistan, although further information as to where exactly he is now during this civil war is quite hard to come by uh, if you don't speak Turkish, which I don't. I may be speaking multiple languages, but I'm not that good. Now, the reason I'm boring you with all of these details is because details matter, and in order to express opinions about something, one first needs to understand the context of it. So, the PKK is now not just one organization, but at least ten organizations, and almost all of them violent and terroristic, who tend to fund their activities through drug trafficking. Officially, the PKK has the People's Defense Force as its military wing, but it also has the Kurdistan Freedom Hawks, which is a special unit explicitly for purposes of urban terrorism. This particular wing is responsible for the rise in palatability of suicide attacks against tourists and other civilian targets. Now, the official mythology of the PKK is that they don't target civilians and that civilian casualties in PKK strikes are regrettable collateral damage as the PKK only targets Turkish police and military. Now, this kind of mythology, you may find it even in a country pamphlet uh, given to tourists outside Turkey, but the reality is that since 2005, the Freedom Hawks have been doing this constantly and arguably inspired Islamists to do that more often as well. Then there is the Free Women's Units, or the YJA, which has its own operations and conducts, quite literally, feminist terrorism. No, I'm not joking. The official ideology of the YGA, YJA sorry, is democratic feminist confederalism. In other pamphlets, they define themselves as anarcho-feminists. In other words, degenerate scum. Then there is the Kurdistan Communities Union, which allegedly is not part of the PKK. In reality, the KCK is the PKK with a smiley face for Westerners who can be then fooled into supporting them without the guilty conscience of supporting the same old Marxism-Leninism. The KCK officially serves as an umbrella group for all the apoist political parties of Greater Kurdistan, including the PKK. The Democratic Union Party from Syria, the Kurdistan Free, Par Free Life Party from Iran, and the Kurdistan Democratic Solution Party uh, from Iraq. Now, if you ask the KCK, the, they don't support the PKK outright, they just want to be a big tent for all the Kurdish organizations in their struggle to get further recognition. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but in addition to having the PKK as members, their honorary president is the same Abdullah Hojalan, and one of the two co-chairs of the Executive Council is Jamil Baik. That would be the current de facto leader of the PKK. Basically, the PKK period is split into four separate periods. The period of peaceful protests between 1978 and 1984, <clears throat> the period of armed struggle with Ocalan uh, being the leader between 84 and 1999, the post-Ocalan era of armed struggle between 1999 and 2013, and finally the mixed agitation era, as I like to call it, when the PKK does both agitprobe manipulation, but also, of course, armed struggle. Now, this period, the PKK period, uh, has mostly ended up consuming the whole cause of Kurdish nationalism because, well, because the PKK happened to appear at the right place at the right time, namely when the Kurdish cause was rather weak and the Soviet Union was willing to fund something and still had money to do it. So the PKK got really big, really fast, ending up marginalizing any other voices, potential or pre-existent, within the Kurdish community. So, now we finally reach uh, the present-day segment for the current political and cultural context. Now, 
In the last few years, especially since the start of the Syrian civil war, it has become once again popular to say you're pro-Kurdish, whereas until 2013-2014, the broad consensus was that the Kurdish cause is source for trouble and violence. Now, this shift in paradigm occurred gradually as a result of various decisions. One was, of course, the fact that some parallel non-PKK organizations managed to get into the international spotlight as doing somewhat good work against the commonly acknowledged evil, the Islamic State, that is. Another reason is the fact that the PKK in the Turkish government managed for a short little while to declare a ceasefire and actually stick to it for more than five days. The ceasefire lasted from 2013 until 2015. With the ceasefire relatively untensioned and the civil war in Syria, that was a great combination for an increase in popularity for the Kurdish cause like never seen in decades. Now, on top of that, there was also, of course, Russian help. With Russia engaged in much more serious agitprobe campaigns than in the 1990s or even early 2000s, the Kurdish cause was one of the beneficiaries of Russia's upping the ante on the propaganda war. And finally, the fourth reason the Kurdish cause became much more popular, the YPJ's female divisions allegedly efficient against the Islamic State. And now we finally get into the controversial ter territory. Now, one of the reasons, or I would argue the most important reason the YPJ's division became popular and a vector of shifting the paradigm on the Kurdish cause is because these divisions fit more narratives at once. They fit the Islamocritic narrative, of course. They also fit the feminist narrative, although feminists uh, weren't particularly happy about that, strangely enough. But they also fit the wider Marxist narrative, and this is the part that conservatives have completely missed. But the Marxists didn't. Here's an article by The Independent uh, about the YPJ, the Kurdish woman building a feminist democracy and fighting ISIS at the same time. Now, I would advise you to read that article in its entirety, but for the purposes of this video, this particular excerpt is relevant. Quote, Long marginalized by the Baathist regime in Damascus after repelling government forces in 2012, Syria's Kurds have managed to carve out a relatively peaceful and stable new societal order based in Rojava in the north, flourishing despite the presence of enemies such as ISIS on all sides. Abdullah has been, drive, has been a driving force in the battle for Kurdish freedom, but as the female co-chair co of the Syrian Democratic Union Party, elected alongside um, uh, male representative Salih Muslim in 2010, it is her particular role to safeguard women's liberation. Skipping a bit, the Rojava experiment is unlike any other. Coalitions between the local Assyrian, Arab, and Kurdish populations have created a small society by and large run on the principles of communal economy, harmony with the environment, and self-governance. It is also hard to conceive just how radically the Kurdish administration has overturned the existing state structures in Syria by putting women's emancipation at the forefront of the socio-political agenda. Women in Rojava have equal status in property law, forced and underage marriage has been banned, quotas for women and the ethnic groups ensure representation at all levels of politics, and of course the armed women's fighting units known as the YPJ have played a central role in the liberation of towns such as Kobani and Manbij. What, that Kur what the Kurds broadly want, despite some infighting and extreme pushback from neighboring Turkey, is stateless democracy, the idea that in a federalized Syria their autonomy can be maintained on a local level with a focus on bottom-up power and little to no interference from the state. This is the third way Abdullah told the Independent on the sidelines of the New World Embassy sessions. We have been so busy working and sending representatives to spread the word around the world that this is the first time many in the administration have been in the same room in years. The delegates were brought uh, together by Dutch artist Jonas Stahl as part of his New World Summit project, a series uh, designed to create spaces for assembly, uh, spaces of assembly that represent a new world and new democratic ideal in the making. Now, they couldn't put more meaningless buzzwords in there, even if they tried.
In practice, what the YPJ is doing is promoting anarcho-communism by adding diplomacy to its violence. Now, Western anarcho-communists haven't learned diplomacy yet, as we've seen recently at Berkeley or at Trump's inauguration. Kurdish anarcho-communists have learned in the last few years that diplomacy goes a long way in furthering insane ideas. Because, let's be clear, this little experiment of theirs works, uh, uh, works solely because it's funded by bleeding heart fools in the West. Once that, fighting, uh, that, that funding dries up, their little communal democracy, or whatever they want to call their commie nonsense, is going to get knotted remarkably fast. So, as I was saying at the beginning of this video, those internet uh, famous divisions of Kurdish females fighting against ISIS are not exactly your average Kurdish woman, but specifically the young Kurdish women who subscribe to a particular type of ideology and join the YPJ, which is a branch of the, as I said, Yakinen Parastina Gil, or the YPG, which in turn is the military wing of the Democratic Union Party, the largest political party of Western Kurdistan, and incidentally, a hard left commie party. Now, I insist on mentioning that it is the less demented than the PKK because although there are many similarities between the PKK and the YPG, the two aren't exactly the same. For starters, there is no evidence that the YPG, uh, YPG sorry, committed any attack against civilian population. Now, that's a big thing for that area of the world. However, it is easy to see why many in the area regard the YPG as being not really different from the PKK. And by many in the area, I mean both fans and enemies of YPG. The Turkish government, for instance, declared YPG a terrorist organization affiliated with the PKK. Meanwhile, former and current PKK members do sympathize with the YPG. So, why is this happening? Well, the short answer is, of course, ideology. The PKK still works from an ideology perspective like a cult. What Abdullah Hocalan says is usually taken as gospel. The left is basically a cult anywhere, not just in the West. The left is a, cult in, is a cult in Syria, it's a cult in Turkey, it's a cult in Russia, it's a cult anywhere. It just takes mildly different flavors. And lately, in the last five or six years, Abdullah Hocalan started shifting the ideology of the PKK through his writings towards something like what the YPG looks like today. Long story short, because I don't want to get uh, into all of those details on how Hocalan views Marxism, feminism, because that's a chapter of lunacy in and of itself. If any current PKK ideologue would run for office in YPG-controlled territory in Syria, that person would win fairly easy, or at the very least would be very, very popular. Now, the reason I insist on this portion is because the YPG is the face of the Kurdish cause right now. So what they do tends to reflect on the entirety of the Kurdish cause. Now, that's an unfair for sure, but that's how politics work. Equally unfair is to project the typology of Kurds in Syria in YPG-controlled territory and Kurds in Turkey who adhere to some of the PKK ideology onto all Kurds. And this is something most people outside tend to do. In reality, the Kurdish people are somewhat connected by language and a small set of traditions, chief amongst them being a fierce sense of uh, autonomy dating back for centuries. But otherwise, there is a difference, quite a significant one I might add, between the Kurds in the spotlight and, well, the rest of the Kurds. What you're getting in the cathedral media is largely the perspective, the perspective of the militant left-wing fact uh, faction of the Kurdish people, namely the adherents of PKK and YBJ, but the story is a bit longer than that. For instance, many people assume that the Kurds are Muslims. And sure enough, a quick Google search gives you this seemingly authoritative source that says that studies have shown that 98% of the Kurds identify with Sunni Islam and 2% identify as Shiite Muslims. So, case closed? Well, not so fast. 
There are at least 30 million Kurdish people out there, most of them living in Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria, but with significant minorities in Armenia, Germany, France and Russia. Kurds make up the most religiously diverse people group in West Asia, by quite a far margin, so the idea that Kurds are Muslims is a reckless generalization at best and mistaken at worst. For instance, roughly 1 million Kurds practice al ihaq or Yarsanism, which is a syncretic religion founded by Sultan Zahak in the late 14th century in western Iran. This religion is basically hippie flower power everyone is great wrapped in the best one could think of in the 14th century, so a religion. Then there is the Yazidis. Yes, Yazidism is a religion, and Yazidi is an ethno-religious categorization, like Jew. Not all Jews adhere to Judaism, but all those adhering to Judaism are Jews. The same is here. The same happens here. Not all Kurds are Yazidi, but all Yazidis are Kurdish. Well, for the most part. Yazidis speak Kurmanji, which is a Kurdish language, and the Yazidis' cultural practices are observably Kurdish, and there's basically no serious debate on whether Yazidis are Kurdish or not. They are. And before the Islamic State started slaughtering them, uh, there were about one million of them worldwide, most of them living in Iraq and Syria. Then there is Zoroastrianism, which is a Persian faith, but nonetheless there are roughly 200,000 Kurds who practice Zoroastrianism. And of course, there's Christianity, which is the fastest uh, growing religion among the Kurdish people. And this is where things get tricky, because, well, converting to Christianity is a death sentence in most places where Kurds live, and where it isn't, such as in Turkey, the Christian Kurds tend to downplay their Kurdish identity quite significantly and identify the most with Christianity, so getting numbers on how many Kurdish Christians are there is definitely not an easy task. Then there is the largest religious group after Islam among Kurdish people, namely the other category, which includes various pagan faiths that I can't even pronounce, and on which research is only available in languages that I don't speak, and of course, uh, this other group includes atheists and agnostics and deists, and very important, the non-denominational Muslims, which are basically atheists who sometimes fast on Ramadan and always celebrate the Bayram, because Bayram is fun. Now this other group, the other, accounts for 2.2 and up to 2.5 million Kurdish people. Now, on top of all of these, most Kurdish Muslims are, well, debatably Muslim. One Kurdish say about Islam among Kurds goes something like this, to the unbeliever the Kurd appears to be Muslim. Now what that means is that in practice most Kurdish Muslims are quite distinct from, well, the rest of the Muslims. The Kurdish Muslims uh, might have a, th a thing or two in common with the Muslims in Bosnia or Albania than uh, with the Muslims in Syria or the Muslims in Iran. It's a very long story on this issue too, but this video is already getting too long. So, to sum up this point, there is more to Kurds than the simple narrative of both the fans of the Kurdish cause and the enemies of the Kurdish cause. The more I think of it, the more I am compelled to conclude that there isn't really a Kurdish cause to begin with. At best, there are several Kurdish causes, each with its own demands and goals and its own tactics to attain those goals. At best. At worst, there is a minority of troublemakers among the Kurds, uh, while the vast majority of Kurds mind their own business and don't seek to create trouble. Now in this video I barely scratched the surface so far, so I can offer a decent enough answers uh, to the questions in the next segment, yet there seems to be an inflation of people out there who have strong opinions about this and, uh, about this and that regarding the Kurdish causes. And most of these people, regardless on where they are on the political spectrum, have read even less than I did on this topic. For instance, very few people have studied the phenomenon of Kurdification, which, as the name implies, is the process through which something distinctly non-Kurdish has gradually been transformed into something Kurdish for political purposes. 
This is a process that was seen in live action between 2003 and 2015 in Iraq, where non-Kurdish minorities have been harassed by Kurdish political parties to suppress their votes, and the same political parties... Uh, um, then lobbying the upper echelons of power in Iraq to include the areas of non-Kurdish minorities, such as Iraqi Christians or Iraqi uh, Zoroastrians, into the so-called Iraqi Kurdistan. Now, Kurdification is not something unique to Iraq. In Turkey, back in 2015, PKK-affiliated groups built a park named after their group's uh, imprisoned leader, Abdullah Ocalan, and a cemetery in the last area in southeastern Turkey with an Assyrian majority. There are now plans to build Kurdish schools there and move as many Kurds as possible to displace the Assyrians. Where do the money come from? Well, drug, drug trafficking and Western fools who donate for the Kurdish cause. How oh, isn't that fucking great? Basically, to sum up this segment, the Kurds aren't necessarily a friend of civilization, but they aren't necessarily an enemy of civilization either. The Kurds just add another layer to the already immensely complex question in the Middle East. Again, we barely scratched the surface here. All right, segment five, specific questions by our patron. Question one, do you think there should be an autonomous Kurdistan? Well, morally, yes, but politically, no. The Kurds are one of the few peoples of the world without a state to call their own. So morally, yeah, I kind of do sympathize with the claim that they should get some sort of place, provided that it is politically feasible. And for now, it doesn't seem to be. Now, if the current conflict in Syria ends with the new part partitioning of Syria, then yeah, sure, the Kurds should get a piece of it. They earned it in combat, fair and square, and more importantly, diversity isn't great. To safeguard the non-Kurds from Kurdification, an independent Kurdistan in a piece of current Syria might not be such a bad idea after all. But only if the current conflict in Syria ends with the repartitioning in Syria of Syria, which I sincerely do not think it will happen. Going further, question two. Should it include pieces of Turkey, Syria, it being Kurdistan, should it include pieces of Turkey, Syria, Iraq and Iran? And question two A, or should a more pragmatic solution, uh, i.e. pieces of Syria and Iraq, be accepted? <clears throat> Now, there will not be any time soon, and by that I mean the next 50 years, at the very least, a repartition of modern-day Turkey or modern-day Iran. It's just not going to happen. Erdogan in Turkey and the Mullahs in Iran are temporary, but the Turks and the Persians are strong people. They will defend their country's territory uh, regardless of the regime in power in Tehran or Ankara. Basically, the neo-sultanic aspirations of Erdogan will be gone in 10 to 15 years. So will the Islamic Republic of Iran, but the Persians and the Turks will live on. Just like Nazis was over, but, uh, but the German people uh, lived on. Now, on to the more pragmatic solution. As I was saying on the first question, this would only be possible if the current conflict ends with the redrawing of the maps of Syria and Iraq. If I were to bet, it seems to me much more likely that Iraq will be redrawn rather than Syria. As things stand now, nobody really defends the Iraqi state per se. Now, of course, this could rapidly change, but for now, only the idea of Syrian state is defended largely by Russia. Now, with various degrees of effic efficiency on the part of Russia, but at the very least, someone does stand for it. Now, I used scare quotes for pragmatic solution because there's nothing really pragmatic about this proposal and it's definitely not a solution per se. Now, after all, solutions don't exist. Pragmatic means dealing with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. But there's nothing sensible, let alone realistic, uh, 
uh, at this point in ripping pieces of Syria to give it to uh, not so sane groups like the PKK or the YPG. Alright, question number three. I'm confused by the competing Kurdish political parties and I believe the United States government has uh, actually named one, the PKK, or to a terrorist list. Uh, can you look at the parties? Well, I did that already. And B, can you think, can, what do you think of each of the parties? Is one more legitimate in your opinion? Well, this is not an easy one. The PKK is batshit crazy, that's clear. The YPG is loony, but is it batshit crazy or just crazy. It's definitely something that I would never support myself, but is it legit crazy or just naive? I don't think anyone has a complete answer to that, at least not yet. As for legitimate, is it, uh, it is again context dependent. Is the YPG legitimate? Maybe. The people living in YPG controlled territory appear to be content with that form of societal organizing, but is that because they fundamentally like and uphold that vision or because the alternative is to fight ISIS even more often than they already do? This is a question that will probably answer itself uh, four or five years uh, after the conflict ends. If the Rojava experiment, as they call it, will still be around 10 years after the conflict ends, then we can start talking about legitimacy. Again, if I were to wager, I'd say this will not happen. Once this conflict ends and the YPG uh, commies get what they want, presumably, another conflict will emerge a few years down the line. This is this time an intra-Kurdish conflict between the YPG commies and the rest of the Kurds who will soon find out that communism actually does suck in practice. Now I could be proven wrong, but history shows that almost no one really likes communism in practice, not even most legit commies. So to answer the question, in my opinion, none of the competing uh, Kurdish pa parties so far are worth much. <clears throat> now I'd like to see a Kurdish party that is neither Islamist nor Marxist. Now, in, fair, in fairness, there is no relevant Kurdish Islamist organization, but there are darn too many commies. Basically, I'd like to see a party that is not based on religion, and Marxism is a religion, especially among Marxist Kurds, who, as I say, they treat Ocalan as some sort of an eternal president. All right. Uh, question four. With Trump now plus Putin, can the obstacles from Erdogan and Iran be overcome? Now, if you mean the obstacles to the Kurdish cause, then the answer is no, not at all. Remember, Putin is allied with Bashar al-Assad. Putin will help Assad to regain control of Syria the way Syria is. So, partitioning the, uh, the, a new partition of Syria is not on anyone's agenda, at least not anyone uh, relevant. Putin is also increasingly friendly with Erdogan in spite of obstacles, and Erdogan wants to see the PKK crushed, and understandably so. It's probably the only issue, issue uh, on which I agree 100% with Erdogan. <laughs> anyway, besides that, Erdogan, like all previous and future Turkish leaders, is opposed to anything that starts with Kurdistan especially if it involves ceding sovereignty from Turkey on any centimeter of land. Again, understandably so. Now, Trump only seems to care about crushing radical Islam by any means necessary and as fast as possible. Now, the Kurds don't represent radical Islam, so at least in theory, Trump would not necessarily be hostile to the Kurds. But that doesn't automatically imply that he will or has to be friendly to the Kurdish cause. Not giving a shit is much more likely uh, to see the attitude coming from Donald Trump. Besides, there are only 20,000 Kurds in the United States at the most, and the Kurds have remarked themselves in the US as, well, as drug traffickers. So there is no serious political pressure on Trump to be friendly with the Kurds. Remember, Trump is a nationalist and a populist. He wants to be liked by the people who are important in his own coalition. The Kurds are just simply not part of that group. Again, if Iraq ends up being redrawn, then the Kurds better would better convince Britain to lobby in their favor to Trump to convince him to give a damn or at 
the very least to, su uh, to support dispassionately the creation of an autonomous Kurdistan, but this scenario is fantasy land already. There are many superior interests to keep Iraq as it is and avoid a repartition. In the end, the most likely scenario is a return to the 2010s status with a quasi-democratic federal Iraq and perhaps more autonomy than in the past for the Kurdish majority regions. Anything beyond that sounds, honestly, sounds like fantasy to me. Again, as things stand now, this could change quite easily if the current conflict evolves in a certain way. Alright, uh, final question number 5, do the Kurdish people offer the best hope uh, of a moderating uh, bulwark within Islam from extreme Islam? Well, do they offer some hope? Yes, of course. Uh, do they offer the best hope? No, I don't think so. Yes, the Kurds aren't Islamists, but they aren't Islamists because they draw their culture from Persians and other distinctly non-Islamist peoples throughout history. They were brought up as people to be non-Islamist. Now, if you ask around, like the colonial officers did in the 1920s when they noticed uh, that Kurdish Muslims do not engage in sex segregation and also seem to like music and dance and basically behave much more familiarly to the European eye than their surrounding peoples, namely the Arabs. Now, if you ask around, like those officers did, you'll get the answer to the effect of this is our tradition, that's what our forefathers have taught us. In other words, there is no intellectual framework that acts like a guard against Islamism, just the instinct to preserve their own traditions, which indeed are distinctly non-Islamist. The difference between the two is made in key moments. When Christians want to radicalize, there is a strong message within Christianity arguing against doing so. And there's strong condemnation of radicalism within Christianity. That's because the Christians also have an intellectual framework that makes them aware that radicalism exists and it must be combated lest Christians devolved into that. There is that awareness uh, right there that, that, that does exist. Whereas with Kurds, such awareness is small because they never needed this awareness to begin with. Now, they could always fall back on their traditions, which were largely safe and largely non-radical to begin with, so they never had to fear devolving into craziness. This is why I don't think the Kurds are the best hope against radicalization. Much more hope I have with actual scholars who constantly strive to reform Islam. To give some examples, Diya al Musawi in Bahrain, Majid Nawaz in the United Kingdom, or the Islamic think tanks funded in 2015 in Egypt with the explicit, explicit task of bringing reformation within Islam. Now, obviously, I don't always agree with these people, but their work is much more holistic and will produce much better results. The bad news is that those results will begin to matter 40 to 80 years from now. These things just take time. Remember, Wahhabi Islam needed 50 plus years to become relevant. Countering that will require at least as much. It's really not an easy task. And relying on Kurds for this? Yeah, no, not gonna happen. Alright, segment 6, miscellaneous. Well, there isn't much to be said anymore, isn't it? The Kurdish question is much older than most questions, and the pretense that it is a solvable question, or more egregious, the current political leaders can actually solve it, is quite outlandish. This is a question that history couldn't solve it, and I don't subscribe to the progressive view that we, the modern people, are so much wiser and braver and greater and whatnot than our most distinguished ancestors, or that the distinguished ancestors, or than the distinguished ancestors of their peoples. That's why I'm not optimistic at all about this issue, and by the same token, I don't think there would be much of a tragedy if uh, this question won't be solved any time soon. Maybe when saner representatives will emerge, things will change. As things stand, with representatives who are unanimously Marxist, when the Kurdish people in general are definitely not, 
I think it would be a mistake to negotiate with Marxists under the pretense that they represent the totality of the Kurdish people. Also, as time goes by, the cause itself will diminish anyway. There are many Kurds in Turkey, for instance, in particular, who raise their children to be good, secular, Turkish citizens. Same goes with many Kurds in Denmark, Germany and other places who no longer want to be associated with Middle Eastern causes and would rather fully assimilate into their new home countries. As time goes by, the reliance on the Kurdish diaspora will go down and thus new alternatives in the Middle East will have to emerge. Alright, that's enough for now. I know I left out quite a lot of things, but this video is already kind of big, so... I'll leave it at that. Thank you for watching. Please do subscribe and consider supporting the work on this channel. Hey, you may get to make me do a video like this for your own topic. <laughs> but no, seriously, none of this would be possible without your constant and consistent support. And with that being said, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.